Welcome everybody. Um, thank you for joining us for um, one of a series of uh, lectures and uh, talks that 39 Essex Public Law Team are doing on uh, a series of uh, different topics. Um, I'm Sean Davis and I'll be presenting this with uh, Adam Bukra who's um, going to be presenting shortly. Um, we are aiming to keep this session to 45 minutes and um, we will have um, a presentation from me, a presentation from Adam, um, and then we will allow some time for questions and answers at the end. Um, if you have any questions, please pop them into the um, Q&A box, um, which will either be at the top or the bottom of your screen, um, and we'll uh, try to answer as many of those uh, as we can. Um, so the uh, topic that we're going to be covering is um, looking at a, a series of um, legislative provisions and pieces of guidance specifically around how um, victims of domestic abuse can be uh, assisted by local authorities, um, particularly in the circumstances of the COVID-19 emergency. Um, so starting um, with uh, the uh, sort of the background to this, um, it's very well doc documented in the press that uh, there's been an increase in uh, domestic violence incidents because of lockdown, um, some of which would obviously have been present anyway, but has perhaps been exacerbated by the lockdown um, and some of which no doubt has been caused because of the, 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 the situation that everyone finds themselves in. Um, uh, and this is from a, a, um, an article in The Lancet last week. Um, an area of concern is the impending crisis of domestic violence, gender-based violence, child abuse and neglect due to movement restrictions, loss of income, isolation, overcrowding, stress and anxiety, um, all of which put women and children at a dis disproportionately increased risk of harm. So that, I think, encapsulates the issue. Um, obviously, the question that, that we're going to uh, attempt to answer um, is what public bodies can do um, to uh, address the needs that arise from um, that sort of gender-based violence. Um, so the legal issues that we uh, will need to cover are firstly um, what uh, a victim of abuse is able to do in terms of moving away from the abuse. Um, having regard to the um, restrictions on travel. Uh, what are the housing and support options from local government? Um, particularly, uh, what are the options for those without recourse to public funds because of their immigration status? Um, human rights implications uh, and Equality Act implications. So starting with the travel and movement restrictions, these obviously um, were eased uh, somewhat uh, yesterday. Um, and so the situation is, is now slightly um, more relaxed. But, but until um, very recently, um, the restrictions on movement during the emergency period were those set out uh, in the uh, emergency uh, regulations. Um, and the only... Um, excuse or the the only reason for which a person could be leaving their home um, was where they had a reasonable excuse um, and the reasonable excuses um, are said to include um, the, the um, measures set out on the slide um, importantly um, they included accessing critical public services services provided by the DWP services provided to victims such as victims of crime to move house where reasonably necessary um, and importantly to avoid injury or illness or to escape a risk of harm. Um, so even before um, those uh, um, restrictions were um, uh, amended, um, in fact, uh, it was uh, permissible to leave the place where somebody was living um, in order to um, uh, avoid a risk of harm, to move house, um, to access vital services. Um, the amendment regulations include um, to uh, leaving the ha your house, your place where you live, to undertake any of the following activities in connection with the purchase, sale, letting or rental of residential property. Um, so the, the position um, even before the um, somewhat more relaxed um, um, uh, emergency regulations was that a, in fact a victim of abuse wasn't prevented from leaving. Um, but, but actually the position now is made um, far clearer. Um, is fleeing domestic violence essential movement? 
Um, well, it is clearly um, identified uh, as uh, an essential um, activity. Um, there is guidance for social landlords on essential moves, um, which says, um, could not be clearer in saying that all social landlords um, are, have been advised to pause non-essential allocation and transfer activity, but essential activity deemed to be in the public interest would include supporting victims of domestic abuse and people fleeing other forms of violence. Um, so again, e even at a time um, when the uh, regulations were more stringent, um, somebody se seeking to move from abuse um, was able to move and social landlords were able to facilitate a move, um, even though the guidance was um, discouraging um, non-essential activity. Um, there's now updated moving home guidance, um, which was issued yesterday. Um, and what that is attempting to do is to um, uh, start things moving again um, so that there is in fact um, greater emphasis on, on facilitating moves um, and in particular that should be to the benefit of those who need to move because of um, domestic violence uh, issues. Um, Moving on to the Housing Act 1996, um, the Housing Act defines uh, homelessness in section 175 um, and the definition of homelessness includes um, a, a, a person who has accommodation but whose accommodation is not reasonable for him to continue to occupy. So somebody who's physically got a place to live but that isn't uh, reasonable to continue to occupy. Um, and by section 177, the Housing Act 1996 um, makes very clear that it is um, not reasonable for a person to continue to occupy accommodation if it is probable that this will lead to domestic violence or other violence against him or against a person who normally resides with him as a member of his family or might reasonably be expected to reside with him. Violence is defined as violence from another person or threats of violence likely to be carried out and violence is domestic violence if it is from a person associated with the victim. Section 178 deals with the definition of associated person for the purposes of section 177. Um, and the Homelessness Code of Guidance at chapter 21 specifically addresses the issue of um, domestic abuse um, and the application of section, the combination of section 175, 177, 178. What the Code of Guidance says is that the term violence should not be given a restrictive meaning, that domestic violence should be understood to include physical violence, threats or intimidating behaviour and any other form of abuse which directly or indirectly may give rise to harm between persons who are or have been partners, family members or members of the same household, regardless of gender identity or sexual orientation goes on to clarify that an assessment of the likelihood of a threat of violence or abuse should not be based on whether there has been actual violence in the past. Um, in other words, it's not enough to say, well, there hasn't actually been violence carried out, therefore um, there's not a likelihood that it will be in the future. Um, and importantly, in terms of the inquiries that a local authority has to make, um, it is very important, according to the guidance uh, and indeed common sense, that the inquiries don't provoke further violence. So um, the, the starting point is that housing authorities should not approach the alleged perpetrator. Um, and so the approach to inquiries is going to have to be um, rather more nuanced so that there isn't a risk of provoking further violence. Um, the difficulty with using the Housing Act for some victims of um, domestic violence is whether they are able to meet the eligibility test and the eligibility test is set out in section 185 um, and it, it, it is based on um, there being two streams of people, those who are subject to immigration control and those who are not. Um, and a person who is subject to immigration control, and that includes anyone who requires, whether or not they have, leave to enter or remain in the UK, um, it, it, that is, is, automatic, is deemed to be ineligible for housing assistance unless they re-qualify um, by virtue of falling within a category of persons specified in the Allocation of Housing and Homelessness Eligibility Regulations 2006. 
So a person who is subject to immigration control starts off as not eligible. They might re-qualify as being eligible, but importantly, they will only re-qualify if their presence in the UK is lawful. Um, and so somebody who doesn't have lawful status is unlikely or is, is, is not going to meet the eligibility test under the Housing Act. So for those who are not eligible for housing assistance, what are the accommodation options? Um, the Housing Act is obviously the, the, um, the starting point, but, but if, if somebody's not going to meet the eligibility criteria, where can they go? Um, is there an Article 3 based right to support? Um, well, the, the difficulty with Article 3 um, is that uh, it, is, it has been held not to amount to a freestanding right to support. Um, so the two cases on that are Limbuella and MK and Barking and Dagenham, um, both of which um, finding that, that although um, somebody uh, being without accommodation, destitute and street homeless, was capable of breaching Article 3 as held in Limbuella, um, that was sort of through the prism of um, a, a, an obligation on the Secretary of State to house asylum seekers. Um, so it was, was not found to be a freestanding um, Article 3 based right to support. The Localism Act is a potential, has been regarded as a potential route into housing um, for those not eligible for Housing Act support. Um, in the case of GS and Camden, um, the Localism Act was, was um, used as a, as a route into accommodation, albeit for somebody who um, had in the past had care needs assessed. Um, but in fact, the cases of MK um, and AR and Hammersmith and Fulham um, effectively shut out the Localism Act route. Um, the Localism Act power, Section 1 Localism Act, is, is the general power of competence. And it's a very wide ranging power, um, but it is limited in that um, a local authority may not use it to circumvent a um, a, a pre-Localism Act limitation um, and the Housing Act section 185, that's the eligibility criteria, was found to be a pre-commencement limitation which the Localism Act therefore could not be used to circumvent. Um, so the Localism Act is not a route into um, accommodation for somebody whose sole need is for housing. The Care Act is another potential um, route into accommodation. Um, but again, there is case law making very clear that uh, the Care Act is not uh, an accommodation power or duty um, for somebody who only needs accommodation. Um, the Care Act is, of course, capable of being used as an accommodation power for somebody who has care and support needs which require the provision of accommodation but where it's just a need for um, ordinary accommodation without any care and support needs um, the care act is is not uh, the appropriate statutory scheme um, as held in the ar and hammersmith and fulham case and in gs and camden um, so the care act is, is pretty much shut out save in those cases where somebody has um, care and support needs um, which would be assessed uh, as being eligible needs requiring the provision of accommodation in order to meet those needs. Um, interestingly the um, Ministry for Housing Communities and Local Government position um, specifically relating to the uh, coronavirus crisis um, is set out in a letter dated the 26th of March um, and what that letter says um, is, this is a letter to two local authorities, and it says that the basic principles um, are to focus on people who are or at risk of sleeping rough and those who are in accommodation where it is difficult to self-isolate, such as shelters and assessment centres, to make sure that these people have access to the facilities that enable them to adhere to public health guidance on hygiene or isolation, ideally single room facilities, to utilise alternative powers and funding to assist those with no recourse to public funds which require, who require shelter and other forms of support due to the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and to mitigate their own risk of infection and transmission. So the, um, the, the uh, MHCLG seems to be envisaging that local authorities can in fact use um, powers, query what powers, um, to provide uh, accommodation um, and support 
to uh, those without recourse to public funds. Um, and then the, the letter goes on to say, talk about urgently procuring accommodation for people on the streets. If you have not already done so, MHCLG will support you. Um, talks about triaging people and then says getting the social care basics such as food, clinician care to people who need it in the self-contained accommodation. Um, and again, this makes very clear that this isn't just talking about accommodation, this is talking about social care, basics such as food and essential necessities. Um, and so it, it is really talking about something akin to um, the sort of provision that would be made under the Care Act or under the Children Act um, to, to those where there's a child in need. Um, for, for those without recourse to public funds, without lawful status, um, solely because of, of the need to um, ensure that the, the coronavirus spread is contained. Um, there's no reference in that letter to the statutory power uh, under which this would be done. Um, and uh, it, it's difficult to um, establish from the letter what, what the MHCLG envisages that to be. Um, there's a further explanation um, of the government position um, in, in its um, sort of media, in the government media um, uh, website. Um, and what this says um, is that uh, we will continue to work closely with local authorities to ensure they have the resources they need to protect people um, currently or at risk of sleeping rough. Local authorities may provide basic safety net support regardless of immigration status. If it is established there's a genuine need that care need that does not arise solely from destitution. For example, where there are community care needs, migrants with serious health, problem, health problems or family cases where the well-being of a child is in question. That seems rather more limited than the MHCLG letter. Um, what, what that explanation uh, seems to be um, going back to is, is the sort of the standard position that a local authority can only do what it can do under existing statutory provisions such as the Care Act, the Children Act. Um, uh, and its housing powers, um, it, it doesn't um, fit, I don't think, with the approach taken in that uh, MHCLG letter. Um, and so there is a real question about the, 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 the lawfulness, the vires of local authorities acting on the MHCLG letter, um, providing accommodation and essential living needs to those without recourse to public funds, um, but, but uh, doing so on a, on a, a questionable statutory basis. Um, specifically read domestic violence, the um, uh, government position goes on to talk about um, the recognition that NRPF restrictions can make it difficult for migrant victims of domestic abuse to access safe accommodation, particularly when refugees um, uh, rely on housing benefit to fund their services. Um, and goes on to talk about various funding streams um, and the possibility of um, uh, additional leave to remain being granted um, uh, under the domestic destitution, domestic violence concession. Um, of course, that, that, that is the long term solution. Um, somebody getting leave to remain and being able to, to um, avail themselves of mainstream welfare support is, is um, absolutely essential in terms of establishing someone's long-term um, support needs being met but but that doesn't in my view answer the question about how you deal how a local authority is to deal with the immediate accommodation and support needs of somebody who who is sitting in social services reception area um, or, or more likely on the phone to them saying that they've got nowhere to sleep tonight um, so query what power combination of accommodation, housing and social care support to those who are ineligible. Um, it, it's questionable having regard to uh, Schedule 3 of the Nationality, Immigration and Asylum Act, whether the provision of those forms of support is lawful unless um, there is a sort of an assumption or a presumption um, that being uh, street homeless and destitute um, uh, and in that situation because of the current coronavirus crisis amounts to a breach of human rights. Um, and so the, the rationale may be um, that, that in fact there is um, a Care Act entitlement um, and that could tie in with the prevention duty uh, in Section 2 of the Care Act 
um, and a human rights based need um, uh, because of the risk of breach of Article 3 um, to um, prevent uh, more serious care and support needs from arising um, by virtue of the spread of the coronavirus. Um, that, that, that seems to be a, at least a logical rationale. Um, it's not one that um, I've seen the government put forward. So um, on human rights issues, there's no Human Rights Act um, based right to a house. There's no right to a home. There are positive obligations under Article 8, but these are limited by the need for connection between the uh, service that's being requested and Article 8. Uh, and of course, there's the operation of the margin of appreciation, um, the, the sort of deference to public bodies um, where allocation of scarce resources um, is an issue. Um, and then the case law on Article 8, the, the well-known case of Bernard and en Enfield represents the high watermark of, um, uh, of Article 8 claims, the deplorable conditions that Mr and Mrs Bernard live in, lived in wholly inimical to private and family life for a long time, no explanation or apology. Um, they were in massively unsuitable housing. Mrs. Um, Mrs. Bernard had, had um, serious mobility limitations, wasn't able to care for her children, wasn't able to meet her own basic needs. Um, and for 20 months, no steps were taken to address the accommodation issue or to provide um, care and support. Um, Anu Frieva sort of rode back from that somewhat by saying um, that uh, it was hard to conceive of a situation where Article 8 required a person to be provided with welfare support where the predicament wasn't sufficiently serious to engage Article 3. Um, but the test is different where a child's welfare is at stake. Um, and of course, in a lot of DV type cases, there is going to be a child involved. Um, and if there is a child involved, then the um, appropriate support route is to go down is, is Section 17 of the Children Act. Um, and then on Article 8, also McDonald dealing with the um, margin of appreciation um, issue. Um, and more recently, Idolo and Bromley, similar um, facts to uh, Bernard in, in that it was about a combination of housing and social care support, but a different result, no breach of Article 8. There had been delay. The delay hadn't been entirely the fault of the local authority. There had been third party issues. Um, social care support had been provided for the, the duration of the unsuitable housing and therefore no uh, liability and damages uh, to the local authority. Um, so Article 14, of course, um, isn't a freestanding um, right, but has to um, attach to um, another um, human, substantive human right. Um, and recently, the Court of Appeal has considered the um, application of Article 14 in the case brought um, originally by the uh, JCWI um, against the uh, Secretary of State for the Home Department um, concerning the right to rent provisions of the um, Immigration Act 2014. Um, and in particular, the obligation that those right to rent provisions impose on landlords to check the immigration status of uh, somebody who is seeking to rent property. Um, the at first instance, it was found that the right to rent provisions amounted to um, uh, a, a unlawful discrimination for Article 14 purposes. Um, the finding at first instance was that this um, amounted to um, effectively a requirement upon landlords to act in a discriminatory manner. Um, the Court of Appeal disagreed with that um, and held uh, that it was well established and uncontroversial that Article 14 isn't freestanding, um, but it relates only to the enjoyment of a substantive uh, ECHR right, and in, in that case, Article 8. Um, for Article 14 to be engaged does not require a breach of the substantive right, um, but there has to be a relationship with the substantive right. The court was willing to proceed on the assumption that while not falling within the scope of Article 8, the facts of the right to rent um, provisions fell within its ambit. And on the basis that there was relevant discrimination which fell within the ambit of Article 8, the question was whether there was an objective and reasonable justification for the difference in treatment. Such justification was found to exist um, uh, on the basis that uh, there was a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. Um, it, the, the legitimate aim was identified uh, as um, uh, supporting the government's efforts in terms of immigration control, 
um, the argument that landlords would um, be effectively incentivized to discriminate was was rejected um, as as not made out, um, but but also as um, a, a, an assumption about unlawful behaviour by landlords, um, which, which the court wasn't willing to accept. Um, so uh, Article 14, recent consideration um, in, in that case. Um, and then there's another um, case that I want to mention, um, and I'm, I'm aware of the time, um, Adam. Um, uh, the the uh, recent case of W, um, in which um, a, a challenge was brought um, to the um, attachment of a no recourse to public funds condition where um, families are granted leave to remain um, uh, usually on human rights grounds but but with um, a condition that they may not have recourse to public funds um, that the effect of that is that families find it very difficult to be able to rent accommodation because of course they require housing but may require housing benefit to do so um, and aren't eligible for things like universal credit um, that uh, the lawfulness of that no recourse to public funds condition was challenged. Um, there isn't a judgment available yet. It's, it seems to have been an, an extemporary judgment. Um, but, but that judgment may be helpful in terms of providing a basis for um, those who are victims of domestic violence without recourse to public funds, um, but, but who are lawfully present um, without recourse to public funds. So, for example, somebody who's come to the UK on a spouse um, visa on a, with an NRPF condition may be able to rely on that um, in support of um, having the NRPF condition lifted. Uh, and that, of course, then unlocks access to, for example, housing assistance under Part 7 of the Housing Act, um, universal credit, um, and those sorts of mainstream forms of support, um, which are much easier to access than having to go um, through the roots of the Care Act, the Children Act, um, uh, and the Localism Act. Um, so just some resources there. Um, so I'm going to uh, hand over to Adam, um, who is going to um, consider the issues arising from the Equality Act, specifically in relation to um, DV victims. Thanks, Sean. I'm going to start off by trying to share my screen so I can get my slides on there. Okay, I'm hoping now that everyone can hear me and that you can see my slides on your screen, uh, picking up where Sean left off. Uh, and I'm gonna focus on uh, implications arising out of the Equality Act for the topic that we're thinking about today, domestic abuse victims, survivors, and particularly in the context of COVID. Now, uh, I imagine Quite a few of you are pretty familiar already with the Equality Act. For those of you who aren't or need a bit uh, of a refresher, I think there are two overarching key duties arising out of the Equality Act that are relevant here. The first one is the Public Sector Equality Duty, commonly known as the PSED. The second one is a prohibition on discrimination. And discrimination can, of course, be either direct discrimination or indirect discrimination. We're going to start off by looking at the PSED and try to think about how that ties in with domestic violence, particularly in this context. So on the next slide, I have set out the key part of the public sector equality duty, which is in section 149 of the Equality Act. It's in subparagraph one. I'll let uh, those who got it on screen have a quick look and what it says, but we're going to be looking at those constituent parts in a bit more detail. As you can see, this duty says that a public authority, which is defined very broadly as in the Human Rights Act, a public authority must, in the exercise of its functions, which covers all sorts of different things, again defined very broadly, have due regard to the need to, and then sets out three aims that uh, public authorities have to have regard to. The first is eliminating discrimination, harassment, victimization, other conduct that's prohibited under the Equality Act. The second one is advancing equality of opportunity between persons who share a relevant protected characteristic and persons who don't share it. 
The third one is about fostering new relations. I'm not going to go into that anymore because it's going to be less relevant to us today. Uh, obviously, you've got to try and work out what the relevant protected characteristic might be. Those are defined for the purposes of section 149 in subparagraph 7. I've set them out on the screen. The key ones in this context are going to be sex, given that most survivors of domestic violence uh, are women, disproportionately are women. They can also be related to other protected characteristics. I put a couple in bold race and disability, and we're going to see how they can tie into the analysis. So recapping that, the public sector equality duty sets out three aims in relation to protected characteristics. The first is eliminating discrimination. The second is advancing equality of opportunity. The third is fostering good relations between different people. Which one's relevant to domestic violence? Uh, my suggestion is that it is B on the screen, advancing equality of opportunity. The question that then arises is, how do you understand that? What does it mean? Helpfully, section 149 uh, contains a definition of having regard to the need to advance equality of opportunity. And on the next slide, I've got that set out. It's quite lengthy, but I'm hoping it's going to make more sense as we go through the different parts. So as you can see, uh, having due regard to the need to advance equality of opportunity between persons who share relevant protected characteristics and, parent, and persons who don't share it, involves having due regard in particular to three things. The first is the need to remove or minimize disadvantages suffered by persons who share a protected characteristic that are connected to that characteristic, that's A. Uh, B is taking steps to meet the needs of persons who share a relevant protected characteristic that are different from the needs of persons who don't share it. C, I think we can leave aside for today's purposes. Now, all that might not immediately make sense, but we're going to go through some examples and see how it ties into domestic violence. We can see an example of that, helpfully, in the explanatory notes to the Equality Act itself, which has some explanation of how these different provisions are supposed to work, what they're, supposed to, what they're intended to do. One of them is about equality of opportunity in the context of the PSED. And the example that's given is the one that's on your screen says that the PSED could lead a local authority to provide funding for a black women's refuge for victims of domestic violence with the aim of advancing equality, equality of opportunity for women, and in particular, meeting the different needs of women from different racial groups. Going back to the previous slide, we can see how that ties into the wording of the statute. Um, what we're looking at here is the overall aim of advancing equality of opportunity. Within that, we're then looking at subparagraph B, which is the need to take steps to meet the needs of persons who share a relevant protected characteristic, in this case, women and in particular black women, that are different from the needs of persons who don't share that characteristic. So that's an example that's given in the Equality Act itself. I'm going to now turn to some of the key principles that are built up in a long line of case law about how public authorities comply with this duty before we link it back again to domestic violence. There's a long line of case law and that's in part because some of it comes from uh, legislation preceding the Equality Act that, was, uh, that dealt with anti-discrimination measures. On your slide you should be able to see a couple of cases that have useful summaries uh, of the principles, because there are lots of them uh, in lots of different cases. The first one's bracking, the second one is hackney. If you want to come back and have a look, uh, I think they're worth consulting. I've also highlighted the case of HOTAC, which is a Supreme Court case which deals with housing duties, uh, the PSUD, particularly in the context of disability and vulnerability. And I've also included a link to some helpful Equality and Human Rights Commission guidance, which has lots of helpful examples about how you uh, deal with these issues in practice. I'm going to not go through all of the principles in the case law. I've just highlighted a few of them, six in all. The first one is the aim of the PSED. Now, its aim 
is to bring equality issues into the mainstream. The idea is that thinking about these issues should become a central part of public decision making. It applies not just to the formulation of high level policy, it also applies to individual decisions. The second one is that the PSED is about substance rather than form. It's not about ticking boxes, it's about thinking about these issues consciously and directly, uh, thinking about whether there's in substance been thought given to them. The third is there's no special uh, form that you can use or special form of words which demonstrate compliance with PSED. I'm sure that lots of you will be familiar with equality impact assessments, particularly when there are big policies affecting lots of people that have been considered, there'll be one of those. Uh, in individual decisions, it's usually a case of incorporating thinking about these issues into the decision itself. But in any event, using a special form referring to section 149 uh, isn't enough in itself. You've got to look at the specific elements of the duty. The next one is an important part of understanding what the PSED is all about. It's not a duty to achieve a particular result. So as long as public authorities have thought about the statutory criteria, the court can't interfere with the decision just because it would have reached a different outcome because it would have given more weight to equality implications. Fourth is that there's a duty of inquiry. So decision makers have to inform themselves about different protected groups that can be affected by their decisions. Lastly, a bit of a caveat to that, it's not necessary to consider every conceivable group that shares a protected characteristic. Uh, we've got to give some thought to it, which ones are gonna be affected will depend on the context and take a view uh, as to those you should particularly consider. Now, linking all of that, it's quite a lot of law, I appreciate linking all of it back into the domestic violence context. I've got some suggestions for what public authorities should be doing, still at quite a high level, to have due regards to the need to advance equality of opportunity for survivors of domestic violence. The first one is in that bullet point, where I say that uh, public authorities should recognize that domestic violence is a disadvantage suffered disproportionately by women, pay careful attention to the need to remove or minimize that disadvantage. The second suggestion is there should be a recognition that women have needs that are different to others as a result of being survivors of domestic violence, pay careful attention to the need to meet them. And for both of those, I think there should be consideration of how they interact with and exist alongside other protected characteristics, in particular, race and disability. Now, if we then apply some of that background into some particular issues that may come up in practice, I've sketched out a few, there'll obviously be many others, and particularly those with a lot of experience and familiarity with how these issues ha have in practice. I'm sure people will be able to think of many different issues. The first one that I've suggested is about identification and evidence. What forms of identification, evidence, paperwork should be expected of survivors of domestic abuse who are trying to seek assistance with accommodation in particular and other forms of support. An example might be an individual applies for assistance with her children to a local authority after fleeing the family home. Local authority asks for identification, say birth certificates to prove, to prove the family relationship. Inevitably, they can't be provided in the circumstances. What are, what are the other alternatives that might help to meet this individual's needs? With their permission, could you contact other officials, uh, maybe a school, maybe a doctor? The second issue that I've set out on the slide there is about communication. How can a survivor of domestic abuse communicate with the local authority that they need assistance which is particularly important, obviously, during COVID-19. Attending in person might be possible, it might have been very difficult before. What forms of telephone, electronic communication are there that don't put an individual at greater risk and help to meet the needs of these people with protected characteristics? The last broad issue that I've set out that I think it's worth thinking about is linked with other protected characteristics and so not just being a woman who's disproportionately more likely to be affected by domestic violence. 
What, for example, are the barriers to communication for certain uh, BME groups? How can they be overcome? Is there a role for specialist organisations? A classic example in that context uh, would be a group like Southall Black Sisters in West London, which has particular expertise in uh, all sorts of areas, but particular language expertise for South Asian languages. What barriers are there faced by disabled survivors of domestic abuse? How can they be overcome? How are all these affected by restrictions on movement during COVID-19? These are the sorts of considerations that come into play under the PSED. Before we move on to discrimination, I just wanted to set out a reminder that the PSED is not about outcomes. It doesn't say that any particular outcomes need to be achieved. So if we go back to that example from the Equality Act explanatory notes that we looked at earlier about the refuge. The PSED, the PSED itself, it wouldn't oblige the local authority to fund a black women's refuge. It doesn't say local authorities have to provide funding for such refuges. What it does do is oblige uh, public authorities like local authorities to consider how the needs of women, including black women, are different to others and how to meet them. So it's about ensuring that public authorities think carefully and specifically about these issues so that they're aware of them. If they're not taking certain actions, they can explain why and they can also be held accountable. So that pretty quickly is the PSED. Uh, I'm going to move on the second half of this talk to discrimination under the Equality Act. Uh, you can see that I have set out the key provisions. The first is a definition of direct discrimination, which is in section 13. The second is a definition of indirect discrimination in section 19. And then section 29, which is uh, the key part of the Equality Act that makes discrimination unlawful. And that's whether it's discrimination by a person providing services to the public or a section of the public or otherwise in the exercise of a public function. Now, indirect discrimination, I think, is going to be most relevant in this context. Uh, it's not an easy topic. Um, some of the case law can be quite confusing. One can see that the statutory definition there isn't all that easy to follow. I'll let you have a short chance to read what's on the slide, and in particular, what's on the slide at section 19.1. But then I'm going to move on to a simplified definition and looking at how it can apply in this context. So as you can see from section 19.1, a person discriminates against another if they apply to that person a provision criterion or practice, which is discriminatory in relation to a relevant protected characteristic of that person. The protected characteristics are defined again for sex. It is going to be most relevant in this context. I think race and disability can also be relevant. And then we can think about how we apply that to domestic violence. Now applying that quite complicated indirect discrimination uh, statutory test isn't always easy. I've come up with a simplified question that we can try and apply, and that's the one in the second bullet point. And it's about uh, decisions around accommodation and assistance. When deciding whether to offer that accommodation or assistance, is a public body applying a policy or practice that puts women at a disadvantage with men? Because domestic abuse survivors, most of them are women, are less likely to be able to meet or come within the policy or practice. If that is the case, and there's some indirect discrimination, can the policy or practice be justified? As before, it's important to think about any relationship with other protected characteristics, like race, like disability. I wanted to briefly mention some of the case law in this area. There have been quite a few judicial review challenges in recent years to local authority housing policies on the basis that they're indirectly discriminatory to women including survivors of domestic abuse. And most of those have arisen in the context of the allocation of social housing, council housing under part six of the Housing Act, rather than homelessness accommodation under part seven that might be more relevant to the need for emergency accommodation. But I think the cases still help to illustrate 
principles. The first one is in the first bullet point, and it's uh, HA and Ealing. And in that case, Ealing had a five-year residency, requir residency requirement before anyone could apply for social housing. And it was found in that case that the requirement indirectly discriminated against survivors of domestic abuse and couldn't be justified. The reason it indirect, indirectly discriminated is pretty, pretty obvious. Uh, if like HA, you've had to leave the local authority where you live in order to get out of an abusive situation and move into another one, you're much less likely to be able to meet a residency requirement. In that case, the judge found that not only was it uh, discriminatory, there was no justification for the requirement. The second case on the screen was about a challenge to uh, an Islington housing allocation scheme, which was also found to indirectly discriminate against women and survivors of domestic abuse. But in that case, looking at the scheme overall, the judge found that it could be justified as a proportionate means of achieving in Islington's aims in terms of allocating social housing. On the next slide, I think these can be worth looking at if you want to come back to look at some of these indirect discrimination issues in more detail. I'm not going to go through the detail of them now. Uh, the first one also involving Ealing uh, involves indirect discrimination against women. The second one, Guru, looks in particular at how these issues tie in with race. Um, I think are both worth coming back to and worth reading if you have the opportunity. I wanted to briefly mention Article 14 that Sean talked about. In lots of judicial review cases, there's a focus on Article 14 rather than the equivalent duties in the Equality Act. In practice, there's not really that much difference between obligations not to discriminate under Article 14 and under the Equality Act. There might be case-specific reasons why you choose one or the other. One advantage of these Equality Act duties, I think it's worth highlighting, is that there's no need to link not discriminating to some other right. It's a freestanding obligation not to discriminate, whether directly or indirectly. So there's no need to show that another right, like Article 8 or Article 3, are engaged and that there's a link between them. And that can be particularly useful in this context uh, as a result of a recent Court of Appeal decision where the Court of Appeal doubted whether or not social housing comes within Article 8 and can be linked to, to Article 14. So to get around all those issues, you can just rely on a freestanding right and obligation not to discriminate in the Equality Act. I've got a few concluding thoughts, and I'm conscious that that's quite a lot of law to go through fairly quickly. And I think some of these legal issues are worth thinking about and taking away uh, thinking about how they can apply in practice to lots of different scenarios. The first concluding thought that I've set out is restating a question that I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> and it's a question for public bodies when they're deciding whether to offer accommodation and assistance. Are they applying any policies or, practice, or practices that put domestic abuse survivors, who are mostly women, at a disadvantage compared to men? Can the same be said for other protected characteristics like race and disability? If that is the case, can those policies or practices be justified? The second concluding thought is about asking oneself whether there are, there are any rigid rules or blanket policies being applied. Those are much more likely to be discriminatory. It's important in this kind of context that there's flexibility in decision-making rather than blanket policies or rigid rules. The third one is linking this discrimination issue back to the PSED. And the point here is that complying with the PSED should help to avoid discrimination and advance quality of opportunity. The PSED is supposed to be a proactive, forward-looking duty. It should help public bodies identify potential discrimination and disadvantage, help them think about how to avoid or minimize those disadvantages and otherwise consider whether they think they can be justified. Now, COVID-19 has obviously put further pressure on many 
public bodies. And um, Sean mentioned some of the difficulties with figuring out which duties and powers uh, can be applied to provide, say, accommodation to particular individuals while the emergency is ongoing. The key point, I, key point I wanted to make is that these equality duties under the Equality Act, they remain in place. In a particular context of domestic violence, when there's more of it, when support networks might not be there that were there before, where there are more restrictions on travel, I think that context makes it even more important that the equality duties are complied with proactively, thinking them through in advance, carefully, thoughtfully applying them to individual circumstances. I think I've probably gone over my time a bit again, and I think we're nearly at the end of our time. Um, and so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and hand back over to Sean and to any questions. Yeah, there's a, there's a couple of questions that have come up that um, I, I think you might be able to answer, Adam. Um, the, the first one that I've picked out is what, whether age would be relevant in um, cases of uh, domestic violence relating to older people. So I think there's a sort of an assumption that, that domestic violence is, is between partners, but, but obviously um, it, it could be a sort of an older family member who's, who's a victim of domestic violence. Um, so, yeah, I think I, I think there certainly could be, um, and I suppose it would be about um, establishing those links to start with, and then trying to um, think about what's needed to respond to that particular group of person. Um, and then another question that's come up, another public sector equality duty question. Um, can it be used um, as, the, as the basis of a sort of an action against police forces to effectively require the um, police to, to, to take action um, to protect victims of, of domestic violence from their abusers? Yeah, it's an interesting one. It's In terms of whether it can get the police to take that action, I'm not sure it necessarily can, and that is in some ways one of the disadvantages and drawbacks of the PSED, because it's ultimately, like I was uh, trying to explain, it's ultimately more about identifying these issues and considering them when decisions uh, are being reached rather than foreseeing particular outcomes. So I'm not sure that the PSED, PSED on its own could force the or could make the police force take any particular actions but what I think it could be used more indirectly to make uh, a police force improve how they help uh, survivors of domestic abuse by alerting them to ways in which they're being failed to try to establish whether or not police forces have consciously and directly and carefully looked into that uh, and if they haven't, potentially establishing a breach of the PSED uh, and hopefully then as a result of that, getting a change in policy. So if you establish a breach of the PSED, um, you, the outcome would be in terms of the relief that you'd get, you'd hopefully get the police force or whichever public body uh, it is to go away and do the analysis uh, and think properly and carefully and uh, which, as I suppose to, uh, in the case, look carefully about these issues, uh, whether or not that would actually lead them to change how they approach these issues would remain to be seen. But I think it would be an important first step, an important part of the overall um, strategy of trying to bring about changes. So sorry, that was quite a long-winded argument. So I, th I think, in short, it could help, but I don't think in and of itself it will necessarily get the outcome that one would hope for. Okay, well, th thanks, Adam. Um, so we, we have gone over to time, unfortunately, we've failed to stick to our um, 45 minutes, but I hope um, that, that people who've stayed with us um, consider that the further intrusion into their afternoon has been worthwhile. Um, so thank you all very much for, for attending. Um, I think what will happen is that this uh, webinar will appear on the 39 Essex website at some point. 
Um, so if there's anything that, that you perhaps missed or you want to see again, um, you'll, you'll be able to catch it on the website. Um, thank you all very much. Thank you.